Hey Merfolk fans, I'm Joe. Thanks very much for joining me today. If you'd like to support my channel, please check the link to uh, my Patreon page in the upper right hand corner. I'm here with a replay of a modern queue playing my blue green Merfolk deck. Let's see how the opening hand looked. So this looks pretty awesome uh, on the draw. We're going to have two draw steps uh, before we need to play any two drops, so we'll have two shots at hitting another land. We'll be able to play Aether Vial on turn one. I tend to prioritize uh, opening hands that have Cavern of Souls in them because um, it's such a bomb against any deck with counter spells in it, and it also helps us cast our blue and green Merfolk, so it's sort of a dual, dual land as far as casting our creatures goes. So a uh, pretty powerful land to have in the opener. Um, a little bit scary though because it doesn't help us cast Spreading Seas or Spell Pierce, but we've got plenty of power with Merfolk, and we're going to have time uh, to draw into lands. Aether Vile helps us get our creatures out, so um, it's a keep for me. Opponent chose to keep, and they are on the play. Let's see what we're up against. So a tap stomping grounds could be a few things. Uh, it could be some sort of miscellaneous creature deck. Um, it could be Ponza, Red Green Land Destruction, um, which we have a great matchup against. Spreading Seas is awesome against their Utopia Sprawls. Um, the Blood Moon can be a bit of a beating. Uh, this could be some kind of scape shift deck. Uh, we can't really tell yet. So let's go ahead and see how my second turn went. I hit a land, sorry, my first turn actually. I hit a land on the first draw step, so that's awesome, but we'll open with the Cavern of Souls. Um, if it is in fact scape shift, we want to not go to 18 land, at 18 land, 18 life if possible, because um, at 18 life they can cast lethal scape shift with 7 lands instead of 8 lands. It's not the, it's not the biggest deal in the world, um, but there's no reason to play Breeding Pool out yet, so um, we'll go ahead, play the Cavern of Souls, and get Aetherbile on the table. That was a perfect first draw. I mean, it could have been a, a non-pain land, but very happy to hit a land. Okay, so we're playing against some kind of scapeshift deck. Farseek gets a tap stomping ground, and the opponent's off to a decent start. Okay, uh, Silvergill was perfect on our side. Uh, we could have hit another land, which would have also been pretty good, but rather than run out one of these uh, two drops, which have very particular late game... Uh, use right like we don't really want to commit our lords to the table um just to have them get bolted or wiped away uh, we want to try to establish island walk and then bring those guys out later uh harbinger can also be useful bouncing creatures so really great that we drew um silvergill adept right now uh, branch walker would have also been really good unfortunately i had to play the breeding pool go down to 18 but again it's not often a, a deal breaker it's not like every match where the opponent just goes for the turn seven scape shift all right, so the draws have been going perfectly so far. We hit land, silvergill, and a third land. Uh, this spell pierce uh, could potentially be great against um, a deck that has a lot of instants and sorceries in it. Um, but they do ramp, so we're going to want to try to use the spell pierce sooner than later. So a very nice turn two for us. Let's see what the opponent's got. Tapped Valakit and... Uh, Sakura Tribe Elder is kind of annoying because if we want to actually push damage, we're going to have to go the Spreading Seas route next turn. Uh, we've got Spell Pierce back up for that, so it's a possibility. Okay, and that uh, third Lord is actually an excellent draw as well, because if you can get three Lords on the table, right now we have one, two, three, your creatures will have a minimum of four power and toughness, so um, the four toughness can survive an Anger of the Gods or a Sweltering Suns, um, and making the opponent's board wipes useless is, is pretty powerful and can just win a game in one, like one or two turns, especially since your creatures are going to be 4-4s. Four uh, the, the reason this doesn't really work super well right now is that on turn three, I can only get out two of these lords, and playing two lords is just asking to get the board wiped. After the opponent sacrifices this elder, they'll have at least five lands, which lets them play around spell pierce. So um, definitely not going to run out two lords uh, into that possibility this turn. Um, I, like, I like spreading seas. One option is to put it on this stomping ground to sort of force the opponent, if they have a bolt, to bolt the Silvergill Adept and not a lord. Uh, but Valakit is such a great target. The opponent's going to sacrifice their Core Tribe Elder. They can get um, closer and closer to 
making Valakit live, they only need to have uh, a sixth mountain to start getting triggers. So Crow Tribe Elder represents a fourth mountain. Um, and then something like um, Hour of Promise or um, Primeval Titan can just make Valakit just go nuts all of a sudden. So I think I'm going to hit the Spreading Seas on uh, the Valakit. But first, I'll crack my Flooded Strand for a basic island. I'd rather leave up Breeding Pool in case Spreading Seas draws me like a Comana Speaker or something. So second Spell Pierce is kind of interesting because... As I mentioned earlier, Spell Pierce is something we want to look to typically play pretty early in the game um, because the, opponent, the opponent's ability to pay the extra two uh, goes up pretty fast as the game goes on and on. But with two Spell Pierces, uh, the, the equation sort of changes a lot. If they go for Escape Shift on turn seven, or I guess not turn seven, but one they have seven lands, um, they pay four for Escape Shift and have three mana up. Uh, three mana can easily pay for one spell pierce, but it can't pay for two spell pierces. So uh, I'm going to want to hold on to these um, a little bit later in the game, I think. So let's bring out a lord. And if the opponent has a bolt, um, I don't think I'm going to counter it here. Let's see how it goes. Um, swing with the Silvergill Adept. Pass to blocks. It was interesting because the opponent... Okay, let's see how this goes. Um, yeah, they bolted the lord but after the point where they could have blocked. Like, typically what you want to do is bolt the Lord during attacks, after I declared attacks, and then you get to sort of ghost block with the, with the Elder, where you block and then sack. No damage goes through, but um, the way that they did this, they messed up the timing, so they're still going to take two from Silvergill Adept, so misstep by the opponent. Okay, and they get another Forest. So actually not closer to their mountain count yet. Again, the, re the reason I didn't cast the Spell Pierce was that since we have two, we wanted to hold on to it later. But here is an Hour of Promise, a uh, five mana sorcery that lets them get two lands out of their deck. Um, just a, such a juicy target for a Spell Pierce. This is the definition of a tempo play, countering a five mana spell with a one mana spell. And countering a sorcery with an instant, so it feels pretty great. Uh, the opponent did not have a land drop. So we'll leave Aetherile on 2. Botanical Sanctum is a pretty poor draw. I'm going to hard cast a Lord, swing for some damage, and we have up uh, another Spell Pierce. So I did a bit of math here. Uh, if I bring in this Lord with Aetherile right now, I'd be swinging for 4. The opponent would go to 13, and I'd have 4, 3, and 3. If I drew another Lord off the top of the deck next turn and played it, it would go up to 5, 4, and 4. Uh, which is exactly 13. So swing for 4, swing for 13 is lethal next turn. So that seemed like a good reason to play the Lord out now, but then I thought if I swing for 3 now, the opponent goes to 14, end step on their turn, I'll bring in Harbinger, and then if I top deck another Lord, I can play this Lord and the other Lord, adding a double buff to everybody. So Silvergill would become 5, Harbinger would become 5, and this Lord would become 4. So 5, 5, and 4 is 14. So swing for 3, go to 14, and then swing for 14 the next turn. So it didn't really make sense to run out the Lord now into a possible board wipe. Um, the opponent obviously has mana to pay for, uh, Spell Pierce, so just swing for 3 now. It's the, the safer and smarter play. Tapped Valakit, passing the turn with 5 lands up. So we are going to put the Harbinger in. As I mentioned, it... Uh, Gives us the possibility for drawing into a Lord and swinging for lethal right now. But opponent pauses on the upkeep and bolts the Lord. So no lethal uh, this turn. We obviously can't spell pierce that lightning bolt. Aether Vial, another dead draw after the Botanical Sanctum. Um, let's see. So now swinging for four means that the opponent goes down to ten. If I end step the Lord, I have eight on board and still need to top deck another Lord, either a Regiri or an Island Walk Lord to push lethal the following turn. But if I bring the Lord in now, I swing for six. The opponent goes to eight and um, I would have eight on board, which uh, without drawing any other cards gives me the uh, option for, or the potential to swing for lethal next turn. And in these kinds of precarious matchups, you want to... Uh, 
If you have a line that, that clearly leads to victory, you want to follow that line. Make the opponent have it. So we're trying to swing for 6 here. And uh, the opponent just took it. So we've got lethal established on the board. They've got 6 lands. 3 cards in hand. And are just passing the turn. Curious. So it drew a Cavern of Souls. These draws are getting pretty poor. But I, I have to say I was um, sort of stunned that they didn't have anything to main phase uh, with 6 mana. So swing for 8. I uh, hope they don't have anything. But let's see. They tapped some red mana, so I was thinking Bolt. But then they started tapping more mana. And actually, they had Through the Breach. So um, another amazing target for Spell Pierce. So... You guys can see that being patient on not casting Spell Pierce to save a single Lord um, pays off in a huge way in this particular match. This is actually the second 5-drop that I get to counter uh, this game with Spell Pierce. So the opponent, obviously, they're trying to put in a Primeval Titan. Um, that could get them a couple more Mountains. It doesn't get any triggers off of Valakit just yet, but it gets to eat... A Master of the Pearl Trident. Um, they would only be at 2 life. But then they get another turn and they can top deck a Scape Shift or something. But I'm just going to counter this with Spell Pierce. And if they don't have another answer in hand, we've got Lethal on the board. And we got there. Uh, opponent goes down to 0. And we won uh, game 1 against Titan Shift. So red, green, through the breach, Titan Shift. Um, doesn't happen very often. Uh, I have to say, I was... I was Pleasantly surprised. Uh, look away if you don't want to see the results of the match. I'm going to click out of this window now. All right, back here with game two. The opponent's going to be on the play. Opening hand. All right, so what do you guys think about this one? Obviously not the most powerful. There's no lords. Uh, there's no spell pierce. I brought in three dispels and took out like a couple of harbingers and something else. Um, definitely left in the Phantasmal Images because those guys can copy um, like a Primeval Titan, which can be pretty good. Um, I forget what the third card was that I took out, but I think maybe I took out one Spell Pierce just because it, it can lose value as the game goes later. Um, oh, you know what? I can check. I can view the sideboard. Sorry about that. Um, so I took out two Harbingers. And uh, I took out one Branch Walker. Now, Branch Walker is insane, but I really wanted to bring in the three Dispels, and I just couldn't figure out what third card to take out. Um, maybe you guys have a different opinion. Let me know what you would have taken out um, instead of the Branch Walker. I've still got three of these guys in the deck, so hopefully we'll see some of them. Uh, so I chose to keep this hand. Um, we've got our lands all sorted. Uh, we've got some Merfolk, even though they're a little bit weak. Uh, the most enticing thing about this hand... Oh, it's a couple things. First of all, we've, we're going to get to draw three extra cards, which is pretty nice. Um, second thing is, if the opponent stumbles on their mana, even a little bit, we can just crush them with Spreading Seas. If we can take them off of green mana early in the game, um, that can just be a, 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 a route to victory in itself. So the hand contains uh, a way to win. It's got a lot of card advantage. Uh, it's a little weak uh, as far as attacking pressure goes. But it's got enough going for it that I think it's a keep. Now, the only real advantage, well, we always want to be on the play. There, there are a couple of good things about being on the draw. Obviously, we're going to have card advantage, uh, but we typically want tempo advantage. Um, so being on the draw gives you a little bit of card advantage. Uh, you get to see more cards than the opponent. But a very nice thing about being on the draw is that you get to um, wait and see what your opponent does with their mulligan. So if they mulligan, uh, it can make uh, a sketchy keep that much stronger because playing 7 against 6 is always an advantage. And in this case, the opponent did mulligan to 6. So um, it sort of cemented my decision to keep the, this 7. All right, so the opponent kept on 6. They put their card on top. Foothills go. I'm going to play Botanical Sanctum and Curse Catcher. I drew an island for the turn, which is absolutely miserable. So I'm going to double check their scry. Um, they did put it on top, which, 
let's see yeah on top which is a good reason to not crack their wooded foothills um if they if they uh, had a card on top that they that they wanted to draw from their scry so just to tap Summon Grounds, it's possible they have something like a Farseek in hand that they can't cast through the Curse Catcher. Ether Vial. So, so far we've drawn Island and Ether Vial, which is pretty terrible. That's not how we wanted the hand to develop. So we'll just attack with the Curse Catcher here and follow up with like Island, Spreading Seas. All right, we're hoping that the opponent is light on lands. Uh, there's some gas. That's great. That's one of those Branch Walkers that we were talking about before. Okay, third land drop. Opponent's going to now crack the Wooded Foothills, get an untapped Stomping Grounds. And, uh, okay, Reclamation's Age is pretty rough. Um, this can be a really valuable card out of the sideboard. Uh, it's three mana for a 2-1 that destroys any artifact or enchantment when it enters. It's going to slow us down on our um, mana denial plan and take us off of Island Walks, so... That's a great uh, turn three play for the opponent. Another Aether Vial. So um, three of my first four draws have been pretty dead. I hit Island, Aether Vial, Aether Vial, and Branch Walker. I think we're going to lead with the Branch Walker here. A Dispel is interesting. It, it makes the case for playing the Silvergill first, in which case... I would have drawn the Dispel and then could have played land and left up Dispel. Um, I did choose to leave it on top. This is... Um, so, when to play Branch Walker first or Silvergill Adept first is, is really tricky. I tend to like playing Branch Walker first because it's got typically a higher power than Silvergill as a 3-2. Um, and its Scry can help set up Silvergill's draw. Right? Like if there's a vial on top and you don't want it, Branch Walker will scry it away and Silvergill will draw something better, hopefully. Um, so leading with Branch Walker here, um, I chose to leave the Dispel on top, but then made a mistake that I've made a few times. I played um, a fetch and then cracked it. So not too proud to admit that I make mistakes with fetch land sometimes. Um, I shuffled away the Dispel to get a basic island and try to thin the deck a little bit, like I was getting a little bit tired of drawing lands and Aether Vials. So uh, I'll just play an Aether Vial here and pass. Um, now, shuffling away the Dispel was not the end of the world because I was going to tap out this turn, pretty much, to get that Aether Vial out. Um, the Dispel was going to be on top of the library, so I couldn't have left Mana Op to use it this turn anyway. Um, Next turn, I've got two two drops, which would be nice to play, um, in which case I'm going to tap out again. So not the optimal time for Dispel, potentially. But we know that the, the opponent plays um, Summoner's Pact and Through the Breach and Lightning Bolt. This turn, just a Cinder Glade tapped and a suspended Search for Tomorrow. Looks like the opponent's not attacking with their um, Rex Sage. Well, okay, they, you know, they didn't attack. Passing with two mana up. They've got three cards in hand. We've got four. So there's a Branch Walker. I actually think that's um, better than the Dispel would have been. And I've got the decision this turn again um, to make about whether to lead with Adept or Branch Walker. Having seen the Dispel <clears throat> made me think that it might be wise to lead with the Silvergill Adept just in the event that I draw into Counter Magic. I can get it into my hand this turn and leave some mana up. So, uh, it, I don't know. It's so, it's so close. If I played the Branch Walker this turn first, then I'd probably play Spreading Seas. Um, then I can Vile in Silvergill next turn. With it being so close, I just decided to run the Silvergill Adept out first this time. Uh, drew a Curse Catcher, which is decent because I get to play that guy with Aether Vile. If I had led instead with the Branch Walker, I would have had the Curse Catcher on top of the deck, in which case I might have wanted to scry him away. Um, and then, after having played Branch Walker, I wouldn't have been able to cast Silvergill this turn, but if I left the Curse Catcher on top, I could have played Spreading Seas, drawn the Curse Catcher, and then put him into play. So, um, as you can see, um, the situation is a little bit complex with... Uh, with whether to play Adept or Branch Walker first. 
Uh, in this case, I don't think it makes a huge difference which one I play first. Let me know if you guys have any observations to make about um, the sequencing in this particular turn. So I went to combat and decided to swing with both of my guys here. Um, I want to get rid of this Reclamation Sage, and if it means trading this Branch Walker for it, so be it. They might also choose instead to block Curse Catcher, but it looks like they're going to try to trade with the Branch Walker. I'm sort of okay with it. Um, the opponent's still going to go down to 15, and then... I could follow up with Branch Walker here, but it leaves me sort of exposed. If they play a land and then wipe my board, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, they've got Mana to cover uh, double Curse Catcher sack. So instead I'll just play the Spreading Seas here. So I drew an Aether Vial, which is rough, uh, because Branch Walker could have scried this away. But as I mentioned, it's just not wise to sort of overextend in that, in that way against decks that run Anger of the Gods and Sweltering Sun. So opponent takes a counter off of Searcher Tomorrow, plays a Forest, Summoner's Pact. Uh, so this is always an interesting situation. If you have a Curse Catcher on board, uh, you can sack it to try to counter a Summoner's Pact, in which case the opponent can just pay one mana. Uh, in, many in many situations, it will push their uh, creature back a turn, um, which can be good for us, but pushing... like Say they get a Thrag Tusk or a Primeval Titan here. Um, making them play it one turn later isn't that big a deal because we don't have a ton of pressure right now, and I'd rather keep what power I have established here and not sack the Curse Catcher. So um, just to push the opponent back a little bit. I think they got a Thrag Tusk, so... There it is. They're going to gain 5 life, which is a little bit annoying. We're going to put a Curse Catcher in and go to our next turn. So this is a, a fun opportunity to show off uh, Merfolk Branch Walker's ability to... Um, or synergy with Aether Vial, where we'll tick this Aether Vial up to 2... This is actually an, uh, another good reason to play Spreading Seas last turn instead of the Branch Walker, because Branch Walker during upkeep will give us uh, the advantage of um, improving our, our draw step a little bit. So let's bring in the Branch Walker. So we see a Silvergill Adept, which you guys know is like the best card in the deck, but there's no way for me to play it this turn. I don't have a fifth land. Uh, and I don't have another Merfolk, so if I draw this guy, I can't play it this turn, which is just a little bit too slow for my tastes. Uh, we've established Island Walk with Spreading Seas, or access to Island Walk, but we don't have any Island Walk Lords, and that's pretty much all we're looking for. So let's put the Silvergill Adept in the, in the graveyard. And I drew into an Island Walk Lord, so things going our way after drawing all these lands and Aether Vials. I can swing for 7 here, which is awesome. Opponent has this Thrag Tusk. We've got double Curse Catcher up in case they go for something like Hour of Promise. Let's get one of these Aether Vials on the board. And um, this is actually pretty awesome because the opponent... I was going to play this Lord uh, this turn no matter what. Things were getting pretty thin with the opponent at 20 life and a Thrag Tusk on the table. We really needed to get things going. Drew the Lord, played the Lord. Um, but... Even though it looks like a huge risk of a board wipe here, the opponent has to pay 4 mana for their uh, Summoner's Pact that they played last turn. Which means that they're not going to be able to resolve a, um, an Anger of the Gods or Sweltering Suns. So they get a land off of the Resolved Searcher tomorrow. Play a Stomping Grounds untapped, which is curious. I'll explain why in a moment. Um... But with six mana, I uh, sorry, three mana, they um, if they tried to cast a board wipe, I would just sack one curse catcher and then uh, still continue attacking for a bunch next turn. Um, playing the stomping grounds untapped. Let's see, why would they do that? If they have a bolt for the lord, two mana lets them pay for a spell pierce. Now they got blown out by spell pierce last turn, last game, and so they are probably pretty um, afraid of getting spell pierced again here. Um, so if they play Bolt, and then I spell pierce it, and then I sack a Curse Catcher to help pay for it, they would take next turn, 7-9. Uh, um, okay, now if they played it tapped, 
and I had a spell pierce, it would just be a blowout because they wouldn't have mono. So they're probably playing the stomping grounds untapped to play around spell pierce, which I guess makes sense. But uh, you'll probably notice here that I have uh, 4 plus 2 plus 3 plus 2 is actually 5, 6, that's 11. It's exact lethal. Uh, the opponent is pretty strongly telegraphing that they have a bolt here. All right, so after a strange opening and a number of unfortunate draw steps, we had uh, two awesome top decks in a row. So if the opponent has a single bolt, oh, we've got this wrapped up here, I think. Unless they go, let's see. If they went after instead, like say I activate Vial and they kill Branchwalker. If I attack with everybody, then it would be 3-3-3. Three, three, three. Yeah, it'd still be enough. It'd still be enough. There's no way to stop this with single bolt. So I'm swinging with everybody. Before any, any opportunity to block, I'm going to activate Aether Vial. Now, very smart of the opponent to cast Lightning Bolt before Aether Vial resolves. Um... You guys figure out why why it's a really good move here, in particular, to um, bolt the Lord before Aetheral resolves. I guess there's a couple of possibilities, right? I um, I could have Spell Skite, which uh, if it resolves, I could redirect the bolt. So that's a solid reason. Another good reason is, um, and an actual thing card that I have in my deck. I don't play Spell Skite right now. Um, but I have Phantasmal Image, and if uh, he let Aetheral resolve, then Phantasmal Image would actually enter the battlefield and copy the Lord. Um, if the Lord gets bolted, then um, I've still got buffs attacking for exact lethal. So the opponent wisely casting Bolt before Aetheral resolves. But I do have the second Lord. It's not Spellskite, and it looks like it's still lethal. So it's 6 plus 5. Yep, it's 11. Same exact math. And the opponent went down to 0. So... Uh, Playing against Titan Shift, I feel like you're always on the cusp of, of just utter destruction, right? Like, I mean, they can cast Scape Shift, they can cast Primeval Titan. There's like death around every corner. But if you play slow, um, I made one bonehead mistake shuffling away a Dispel. I didn't get punished because it, I drew into pretty good cards after that. Um, but you also have to be really careful um, and thoughtful about which opening hands you keep. Um, I kept a pretty underpowered uh, seven to start this game, and I, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on my opening seven. It was like three lands, two spreading seas, curse catcher, and silvergill. Um, but it, you know, the card advantage sort of got us there eventually. Uh, no, no spell pierces this game. Um, I forget if I looked at the sideboard here. I. I took out two Harbingers and a single Branch Walker to bring in three Dispels, which we didn't see any of uh, this game. Did see two Branch Walkers, though, who did a great job. So yeah, uh, in the end, uh, two games to zero against Red Green through the Breach, Titan Shift, etc. Um, it sort of feels like going 2-0 and against Affinity. It's definitely one of our worst matchups. People online, uh, seeing my recent list, mentioned that it looked, it looked weak to this matchup. Um, it doesn't have any of the counter spells that are strong against uh, Scape Shift uh, in the sideboard. I just have a, a, uh, the three dispels, but the three main deck spell pierces actually do a really solid job um, against this deck. Even if it just counters some ramp spells earlier in the game, um, that that can win because uh, this deck needs to hit a lot of lands to get going. And if you counter a Far Seek or if you counter a Search for Tomorrow, that slows them down by an entire turn a lot of the time. So thanks for watching, guys. Um, please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, if you'd like to support my channel, uh, please check out the link to my Patreon page. Um, let me know how you've been doing with Blue Green Merfolk. Let me know your thoughts on this particular match, any other thoughts you might have, and I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks again, guys. Bye.